Hi, and welcome to this video where I'm going to basically give you a quick introduction to Pydantic V2. I have a full Udemy course if you want in-depth coverage of Pydantic V2. The goal of this video is just to get you started with V2. And if you're looking for Pydantic version 1, then I also have a video in the channel that covers Pydantic version 1. And that link is in the Jupyter Notebook that accompanies this video. Now, one thing that you'll need to know, of course, for Pydantic is basic Python type hinting. So you need to know that because Pydantic, both version 1 and version 2, essentially use type hinting, just like data classes, to define fields in our classes or our Pydantic models. If you don't know type hinting, I have a video on that as well in this channel. And if you look at the Jupyter Notebook, there is a link to that video. I also provide you a link to the Pydantic documentation. Of course, you'll need to install Pydantic first, and you can just do a pip install Pydantic. I also provide a link to the Pydantic installation documentation should you need it. If you run into problems, doing just pip install Pydantic should work, but if it doesn't, you have that documentation available. Now, Pydantic data models are simply Python classes with extra functionality provided by Pydantic via inheritance. So let's start by looking at a basic model. To do that, we need to, from Pydantic, we need to import base model. Once we've done that, we can create a model this way, and it is done through inheritance. So unlike data classes that are done using a decorator, because data classes are code generators, nothing more, whereas Pydantic is actually providing the extra functionality that we have the validation and the passing functionality that we have in Pydantic through inheritance. So basically this base model is what has a lot of the functionality that we're looking for. So we create classes that inherit from base model. So let's go ahead and create a field and we'll create first name to be a string. This is the type hinting. Last name should be a string as well. And then say we have age, that's gonna be an integer. And that's it. This is a very basic Pydantic model. As you can see, we define the data type of the fields in the model using Python type hints, and we inherit from base model. We can now create instances of this model in a variety of ways. We could do something like this. We could say p equals person, and we'll specify the first name equal to, let's say, John. Then we'll say last name equals Smith, and let's say age equals 42, like so. And if we look at P, Pydantic provides us a default representation. We can always override that and choose which fields actually show up in that representation. By default, it includes all the fields. And you can see that it basically was able to take this data and create a model. And this is basically an object. This is a class instance in Python. So Pydantic will also perform validation on your input data. In some cases, it will attempt to coerce the input data to the proper type. But when it cannot do so, and when validation fails in general, Pydantic raises a validation error exception, which is a Pydantic exception. So the idea behind this is that once you actually have an instance of the model, you are guaranteed that first name is going to be a string, last name is going to be a string, and age is going to be an integer. And in fact, you're also guaranteed, because of the way that we define the things here, that those fields will be populated. They will not be none, because these by default are all required. We'll take a look at what optional fields are a little bit later. So let's go ahead and just see how the validation errors work. So from Pydantic, we're going to import validation error. And then we're going to do a try. And I'm basically going to take this that I have over here. And instead of age equals 42, I'm going to pass in a value that is not coercible. Now, I do want to mention that it will try, Pydantic by default, will try and coerce this. So this is a string, right? But our age should be an integer. If we execute that, you'll see that our age now is back to an integer. So Pydantic actually validated this, but also coerced it to an integer. Now, in this case, it can't. This cannot be coerced to an integer, so it will fail. And we'll get a validation error, 
and then we can just print the error. And as you can see, our message says we have one validation error, the age. The input should be a valid integer. And in fact, we passed it an input type of string, right, with this value over here. And in fact, let me show you another thing. If we go ahead and change this to, let's say, 100, Pydantic will not, by default, serialize objects to strings because objects always have a string representation. So saying like, okay, well, I'm going to take the string representation of whatever you pass in here and put it into last name is too broad of a coercion. It, you can easily introduce bugs that you wouldn't even be aware of by doing that. So instead, Pydantic says, nope. By default, if you pass me something that isn't a string here, I'm not going to try and coerce it to a string. So if we try and run this, you'll see that now we have two validation errors. The last name, the input should be a valid string. It wasn't, it was an integer. And of course, we still have the age. Now fields in model instances can be accessed using object dot notation. So if we go back to uh, an example that works, I can now access the fields just using dot notation. So we're dealing with a regular Python object. We can even mutate those field values. We could say p first name equals James. And if we look at p now, you can see that that has changed. Now the first name was mutated. It is now James. Now one word of caution here. By default, Pydantic validates the data being deserialized as we saw here when we try to pass it, let's say this, it failed, and this, it failed. But it doesn't validate data that's being changed via an assignment, not by default. We can't force it to do that, but by default it doesn't. So you have to be a little bit careful here because I could just go and say ph equals unknown, or if you want junk, since we saw that that raised an exception. And if we do that, you can see that age now has been mutated, and it is this string, which is not really consistent with what we defined in the model. All right, so just a word of caution here. So I just want to expand a little bit on validation exceptions. As we just saw, Pydantic validates all the fields. It does not just stop at the first validation error. See, here we had two fields that basically failed validation. Pydantic gave us the two validation errors. It does not, let's say, reach last name, find a validation error, and then stop processing the rest of the data. It continues, it tries to essentially deserialize, load this data into the model completely, even though by the time this has failed, we know that we're not gonna get an instance model, we're gonna get a validation exception. It still continues the whole passing to identify all the problems so that you get basically information about everything that's wrong, not just the first thing. So that's very useful to know. Now, so far, we've just been printing the error message, but you can also get the list of errors as data using some special methods that are provided by Pydantic's validation error exception. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to just take this over here. And instead of printing it, I'm going to assign it to a variable called exceptions. So I'm going to take the exception and assign it to this variable. I now have access to this variable, which is this validation error instance. And it has a couple of methods on it that are quite useful. One is called errors, like so. And we, we do that, we get this list. It's just a Python list. And you can see then you have dictionaries for the items. And it tells you the message. Input should be a valid string. It was for last name. The input was 100. Here, you also get another error message. It tells you that it was for the age. The input should be a valid integer. So basically, the information that we saw with the print statement, you can recover as data by using this errors. And if you're working with REST APIs, you most likely are going to want to return this data in JSON format. So Pydantic has this covered here as well. We can say JSON, exceptions.json. And you'll get essentially the same data, but now in JSON format. And you can, if you want, modify this, or you can just return it as is to the caller of your API to tell them you have a problem in the data that you submitted.
The next thing I want to look at is deserializing data in more general terms. We saw that we could essentially load a model by providing the field names with their values this way, and you have to pass them as named arguments. You cannot pass them positionally. But there are actually two additional ways of loading data to create a model. And of course, that is called in general deserializing data. Here, we're deserializing named arguments. Here, we can also deserialize using dictionaries. So if we have data that looks like this, I'm just going to copy paste that from the notebook. Let's say that our data looks like this. As you can see, it's a dictionary. The keys correspond to the field names in our model, and then we have the values. So what we can do here, we can say p equals person dot model validate, and we're going to pass it data. And you can see that now we end up with this same object that we had before. Well, it's not the same object, but an object with the same state, the same data in it. But we got that from a dictionary. We deserialized the dictionary into a model. It also supports deserializing from JSON. So now this is a string. It looks like a Python dictionary, but it's actually a JSON object. It's a string. So to do that, to load that up, we have to do a model validate, but we have to tell Pydantic that this is actually JSON. So we say model validate JSON and we pass it data JSON. And if we do that, as you can see, again, we get the same result. We get a person instance with the appropriate data. The next thing I want to look at is this required versus optional fields. I already mentioned that by default, all fields are required. And indeed, if we try to deserialize data that is missing any of those fields, we'll get a validation error. Let's try it with the current person model that we have. So if we just pass in the age, but I omit the first name and the last name, then we are going to get a validation error as well. And you'll see that we get two validation errors, that first name is required, last name is required. And of course, the same thing happens if I pass it a dictionary, let's say, with age 42, the, the same thing is going to happen, right? That data is, is missing, the first name and last name. So if we do that, and I'm going to try, and we'll say person, model, validate, we'll pass in data, and of course, we're going to get an exception as well. So we'll get a validation error, and we can go ahead and print that error. And you can see we get the same exceptions, essentially. So how do we make a field optional? We simply provide a default value for it in the model. So if we take our model that we had over here right in the beginning, we'll take this one, and we are now going to add some defaults to those fields to make them optional. So I'm going to make age optional by setting a default equal to zero. And you should always make sure that you set your default consistent with whatever the type is that you're specifying. So don't go ahead and specify a string here. By default, Pydantic is not going to validate your defaults. So this means that you could technically put in a string here that, that doesn't match this integer type. Pydantic isn't going to complain. There are ways that you can configure your model so that it will actually validate those defaults and raise an exception. But since we're controlling what this is, we shouldn't have to do it. We just have to be careful that we specify proper defaults. So one thing I want to show you is we can inspect what the model fields look like, what their definitions look like. And we do that by using this model fields attribute that is on the Pydantic model. And you can see that it tells us we have a dictionary. The keys are the field names. So first name, last name, and age. And then we have this field information. It tells us that it's a string and that it is required. Now you'll notice for age, however, required is now false. And that's because we have a default and the default was zero. So now we can create an instance this way. We can say p equals person. And of course, you can deserialize however you want. You can use data, you can use JSON, or you can use named arguments. I'm going to use named arguments in general because it's much simpler to define that rather than having to define a dictionary and then model validate it. But it's doing the same thing. So last name equals Smith. And you'll notice now I'm not passing an age in. Before, we would have had a validation error. Now we no longer have that and the age was set to the default. Now, if I specify the age, 
it's going to be whatever the age is, right? So you can see it took that. But if I don't specify it, it's going to fill in the default value. So this brings up the next topic, which is the one of nullable fields, because we can set defaults to none. But you have to be a bit more careful, because if you take a look, let's say, at this class over here, let's go back here, and let's say that I want to allow first name to be none, right? Now, you remember what I told you just now, that you have to be careful that the type you're assigning as the default should be consistent with the type that you declare the field to be. Well, none and string are not the same types. This is the none type, this is the string type. So technically, this is incorrect. Now, of course, as I mentioned, Pydantic doesn't validate your defaults, so it will be perfectly happy to put none into first name, even though the field says it must be a string. So in order for this to be corrected, what we really need to specify in the type hint is that this type string can also be none. It can be nullable. So we can say it is string or none equals none. And that is the correct way of doing it. And now if we look at the model fields, let's take a look at what it says here. You can see that first name is no longer required. And that's because we have a default of none. And in a second, I'm going to get into this, what this union thing is. For now, this is how we're specifying a nullable field. And this is newer syntax. I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me just show you first that we can say person last name equals Smith, because now everything else is optional because first name has a default, age has a default. So the only required field in this model, as we can see from the model fields, is just last name. So if we do this, everything works just fine. And of course, we have none for the first name and zero for that. Now, let me go back to this notation here, string or none. This is just an alternative syntax that's available in more recent versions of Python. I believe it's Python 3.10 and above. For older versions, you can use the canonical way of doing this, which is using a union. So this is just syntax. What, it re what this really means is the following. We can say from typing, import union. I know I said that you need to know typing, you know, type hinting to take this video, but let me just show you that very quickly. So if I take this class again, instead of specifying it this way, I can say it is the union of string and none. This is the exact same thing as specifying things this way. And so, in fact, if we look at person model fields, you'll see that we exactly have the same thing. We have this union string none type. You can see it's identical to here. So this is just kind of, you know, syntactical sugar, essentially, that we don't have to have this horrible looking thing that's pretty long. Instead, we can write this much simpler. But it's only for more recent versions of Python. Now, there is actually a third way of specifying it. And that's to use the optional from typing. Now, I do not like this. So I'm going to show you how it works. And I'm going to show you why I don't like it. So what's equivalent to writing this is to say optional string. Like so. So what does this optional string mean? It just means that this is a nullable field. This field can be string or none. It happens to have a default of none, but this optional has nothing to do with, with whether the field is optional or not, whether it's required or optional. This is why in the context of Pydantic, I do not like using optional because it is confusing. Because if you have this model over here, right? If, some, if you're just reading this quickly or you're not quite aware of the difference between nullable fields and defaulted fields, you might think that, oh, well, this is an optional field. And of course, that is not the case. If we look at model fields, you'll see that this required now is still true. It's back to true because why? Well, because we didn't specify a default for first name. So that's why I don't like using optional. But go ahead, feel free to use whatever you prefer. So Pydantic fully supports Python's type hinting system. So for example, you could specify a field to be a list of certain type. We could do something like this. We could say, let me go back to our original class person as we had it over here, this one. So I'll take this 
model and I'm just going to add to it. I'm going to say that person has lucky numbers and that should be a list of integers and I'm going to make it a default of an empty list. And I'll come back to this because I know that some of you, if you're used to data classes, you know that you can't do that. If you're used to Python and function arguments, you know that you shouldn't do that. But Pydantic allows us to do it and it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly acceptable to do that in Pydantic. I'll come back to why. So if we do that and we look at person model fields, you'll see that now we have lucky numbers, if I spell it right. And we can see that it is a list of integers. It is not required because the default is an empty list. And so by doing this, the type coercion is going to apply. Not only does lucky numbers have to be provided as a list or something that can be converted to a list, like a tuple, for example, but the elements of that sequence are going to have to be coercible to integers as well. So let's take a look. Let's say I say P equals person and I'll just specify last name because that's required. And then we have to specify lucky numbers as well, not because it's required, but because I want to show you something. So lucky numbers equals, and I'll do one, then I'll do the string two, and then I'll do the float 3.0. Now, all of these can be coerced to integers. There is a way that you can configure your model so that you can stop certain coercions from happening. That's called strict coercion by default. Pydantic uses something called lax coercion. I'm not going to get into that here, but basically it's a, it's, you, you can make the coercion stricter than this. In this case, however, Pydantic is perfectly happy to coerce one to an int. Well, it's already an int, so it doesn't have to do anything. To coerce the string two to an integer, that's possible. And to coerce the float 3.0 to three. And these are indeed all integers. If we want to make absolutely sure, we can say for number in p dot lucky numbers, and we'll just print the type. Let's let's just print the type of number like so. All right, and you can see they're all integers. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are aliases, and this is where I'm going to introduce to you Pydantic's field class. Sometimes the data we are attempting to deserialize uses names that we simply do not or cannot even use in our model. For example, consider this data that we would like to model using Pydantic. Let's say that you're getting data back from some data source and this is what you're getting. And it happens, right? This isn't far-fetched where you have first name with a space in it, last names, all caps, age in years has spaces in it, ID is actually a you know function in Python. So we you know we probably don't want to use ID as the field name in our model. We certainly cannot use first space name. That's not a valid variable you know name in Python. We probably don't want to use this because it's all uppercase. That's not Pythonic. And again, this one we can't because it's got spaces in it. So how do we deal with that? Well, Pydantic has a way to define an alternative name to our field names, and those are called aliases. And here's how we would set up a model to handle that data. So from Pydantic, I need to import field. We're gonna need that class. Let's go ahead and create our class person. And we're going to inherit from base model. And what do I want? Well, I want this field ID, but I don't wanna call it ID here. So typically what we do in Python is that if we have a reserved word or a keyword or something, we just basically tack on a underscore at the end. That's how we get around that problem. And you'll see that used all the time. So this is gonna be an integer, but that's not how the data is defined in my data dictionary. As you saw, we had to match between the names in the dictionary or the JSON or the argument names to the field name that we have here. So here, I want to basically provide something else. And I use this field class and I'm going to create an instance of it and I'm going to set an argument called alias. And this alias is going to be the name of the field in the data that I'm deserializing. So here it's ID. Then first name, I'm going to call it in Pythonic terms, first underscore name, that's a string. And that should be a field with an alias equal to, well, first space name. 
So we have that. Then we have to define last name, which is again a field, and then the alias equals last name. And lastly, we have to do the age, which is an integer, and it's gonna have now an alias equal to age in years, like so. So this is our model. And now that we have that, we can go ahead and model validate our data. That's person, model validate, and we're going to pass it data. And if we did everything correctly, it should validate correctly. It should deserialize correctly. And you can see indeed that we got 100 in ID, we got John, Smith, and 42. So this is why we have aliases. That's one of the reasons we have aliases. Now, pydantic models also give us the ability to do the reverse process of deserializing, which is serializing. And so basically we can take this Python object, right, this P here, which is an instance of this person class, it's just a Python object, and from that we can generate a Python dictionary that's going to contain basically the field that we have, the fields that we have here with their values. So those field names with the values. And then we can do the same thing to generate JSON out of that. And it's very simple. We just say p.model dump, like so. And you can see we have a Python dictionary where we have the field names, not the aliases, but the field names and the values of each of those fields. Now, if we want JSON, we can do the same thing, but we can just say dump model dump JSON, like so. And we will now get a JSON string. So as you can see, serialization uses the field names, not the aliases to serialize. Now, since we have aliases though, we could, if we wanted to, also serialize using the aliases instead of the field names. Again, very commonly used in REST APIs. How do we do that? Very simple. We do a model dump, but now we also specify by alias equals true. And when you do that, you can see that now it's using the aliases, ID, first space name, right, last name like so and age. And if we do the model dump JSON by alias equals true, we'll get the same thing. But now, of course, we're getting JSON string output instead of a dictionary. Now, when we use the field object to define an alias, we lost the ability to set our fields to some default value. Because remember how we were doing the default before? We were just saying this, int equals zero. Well, now I have this field over here. So I can't do that anymore. So instead what we have to do is we have to move the default inside the field. So let's go ahead and do this model, person, base model, and we're going to have first name is gonna be a string and I'll make it nullable and that's gonna be a field. I'm gonna give it an alias using the camel case version, so first name. This is again very common in REST APIs where JSON follows camel case convention, but in Python we follow snake case convention for naming things. But here I want to set a default and all I have to do is just specify default. And then I'm going to do last name and last name I'm not going to make it optional. So it's going to be string and it's not going to be nullable and I'm going to only set the alias. So I'm going to require it and I'm going to make it non-nullable. So last name. So now if I have a piece of data that looks like this, where I have last underscore name. Sorry, I need to pass in the alias because I specified an alias. So I'm going to specify last name, Smith. We'll see that when we deserialize this data, so model validate data, you'll see uh, P equals, my apologies, you'll see that first name indeed was set to none. It defaulted to none. When we specify an alias, we must use the alias when deserializing data. As you saw, I'm using the alias here to deserialize. In fact, if I was to try and deserialize data using the field name, right, first underscore name, we will get a validation error. So if I try and say first or last name, because that's required, so let me do last name. If I try and set it this way, then I'm going to get a validation exception. As you can see, we get that last name is required 
Why is it complaining about that? We passed it last name. Well, it doesn't know what last name is, last underscore name. And by default, when you deserialize data in Pydantic, if you have extra fields in your data, it just ignores them. There are ways that you can modify that behavior so that you can actually have it raise an exception for you, or you can actually have it added to the model on the fly, basically. But by default, it just ignores it. So it ignored last name here, last underscore name, because it doesn't know what that is. And so therefore it said, well, I need last name, this camel case version. And this would be the same if you had a piece of data, for example, that had, let me take this. So if we had last underscore name here, it would be the same issue if we were deserializing from a dictionary or a JSON string. So model validate and we'll give it data like so. So we'll get the same exception. So can we change that? And the answer is yes. And for that, we have to do these model level configurations. There are many of those. I'm going to show you one here, which is to allow population by field name, not just by alias. So we want to be able to allow this so that we can populate fields using either the alias or the field name. And to do that, we provide a model configuration. And we do this by simply creating another attribute in our model. So from Pydantic, we're going to import this object called config dict. And then we're going to create our model. So class person, and basically I'm going to take whatever we had before. So let me just go ahead and copy that instead of retyping it. So I'm going to take this model over here that we had, but I'm going to add a configuration on it. So here you have to use model config. You have to use that name. It will not be treated as a field in the model because Pydantic understands what model config is. And this is why the name is important. It has to match. And we're going to set it equal to an instance of config dict. And in config dict, we can specify various named arguments. In particular, the one that we're interested in here is the populate by name. And we set that equal to true. By default, it's false. But here we're overriding that essentially. So when we do that, I can now go ahead and create a person. And normally I would have to use the alias. I would have to use first name equals John and last name equals, let's say, Smith, like so. But because I have populate by name set to true, I can change that. I can say, no, I want to populate by this field name, first underscore name. And you can see I'm leaving them mixed. Here I'm using the alias, and here I am using the field name. So if I do that, you can see everything worked just fine. And if we have a piece of data like this one here, then when we do the p equals person dot model validate data, you'll see that everything works fine as well. Even though I have here the field name and here the alias, now we can populate using either. We can deserialize using either. Okay, next, I want to talk about mutable defaults a little bit. So returning to that, one thing that Pydantic can handle is setting default values to mutable objects, something that is usually problematic in Python. You don't do that, for example, with function arguments. And it's also by default disallowed in data classes. But in Pydantic, defining defaults this way is perfectly acceptable. Because what Pydantic does, and let me, let's me let go back to an example. Let me just do this model over here. So we're going to have a list of integers, and that's going to be an empty list. So this is what I'm talking about, right? You don't do that in data classes. You don't do that in Python uh, default arguments for functions. But Pydantic, it's perfectly fine to do that. Why? Because Pydantic basically looks at the default value that you have on a field. And when it creates instances of the model, if it sees that the default value is a mutable object, it will go ahead and create a deep copy of that mutable object. So that's how it kind of gets around that issue, right, by doing this deep copy. So this is actually perfectly fine and perfectly legal in Pydantic. In fact, if we do m1 model and m2 model, as you well know, with Python functions, if we had that, we would now have a shared reference to the same default list. Now, in this case, we don't. If I go ahead and say m1 dot numbers dot extend, 
and let's go ahead and extend it with one, two, three, then you'll see that M1, the numbers has now been extended. So now it's the list one, two, three. But if I look at M2 dot numbers, you'll see that it's still the empty list. But this does lead to an interesting point, and that's default factories. Because sometimes we want to generate a default not as a static value, but rather as a value that should be calculated each time an instance is created, when that creation needs the default. Every time we create that instance, if it needs a default, we want that default value to be generated at that point in time. It could be, for example, generating unique identifiers. Obviously, a unique identifier should be different for every instance of your model. Or it could be a date. And let's say it's a date time. Every time we create an instance of the model, we and if we don't specify the date, let's say for a particular field, we want it to generate the current date time, right? That kind of thing. And of course, you cannot do that by assigning a static value here, right? So instead, you have to use something called a default factory. So let's take a look at it. That will make a lot more sense when we do this example. So I'm going to import date time and time zone from date time. And now I'm going to create this log class. So we're going to inherit from base model. And then we're going to have DT is going to be a date time. And I want it to be a field. And I want to generate a new date time. If I don't provide date time, I want the default to be auto generated as the current date time. So for that, we have to specify default factory. And default factory expects a function. And it's a function that takes no arguments, and it should just return whatever that default is that you want to generate. So in this case, I want to generate date time dot now, but I want it in UTC. So I'm going to say date time, time zone UTC. Now, the problem, of course, is that this over here is not a function. That's an actual static value. Default factory expects a function. So all I need to do is just to turn that into a function, make it a lambda. It will get called. No values will get passed to it. And it's going to return this. And every time that the default is required when it's creating an instance of log, it's going to call that function. And let's do one more here. Let's do message string like so. So now I can say log one equals log and I'm not going to specify the date time, which means it will have to use the default and the default will be auto generated. So we'll say message one, let's say. So I've created that object. Now I'm going to do log two equals log and message equals message two. So I've created those two instances. And now let's look at log one. You can see that I've got a specific date time here. And if I look at log two, you'll see that I have a different date time, right? It changed the date time. So that's what default factories are for. They can also be used very often to generate UUIDs, where you want the default UUID, of course, to be different for every instance of your model. But it could be something else too. It could be running, let's say, a query against a database to go and retrieve some data. Or it could be you know, making an API call to some external API to retrieve some data and using that as your default value. So it can be whatever you want. It's just an arbitrary function. Here, as a, I wrote it as a lambda. Of course, it could be a separate, you know, function using a def. That's a lot more complicated than this lambda over here. So the next thing I want to look at is custom serializers. Pydantic has a default way of serializing data. For example, serializing floats will result in a certain number of digits after the decimal point being used, dependent on the actual float, of course. Let's take a look. So if we create this model, inherit from base model, and we're going to create number, and that's just going to be a float. So now I can go ahead and create an instance, and let's say I use 1.0, and if I look at m.model dump, so I'm not looking at the representation here. I'm looking at the serialization. That's very important. That's a little bit different. So we get this number here, this float, like so. And if we did, of course, JSON, we'd get the same thing, but as a JSON string. Now, let me go ahead and say model m equals model, and then number equals one divided by three. And if we look at what that is with a model dump or a, or a model dump JSON, I've got to specify number correctly. 
you can see that I have now all these over here, right? So it's a little bit of a different representation in the serialization. And the same thing would happen with the JSON dump. We get kind of the same result. Now, similarly, date times, for example, get serialized to JSON using the ISO format. So if we take, let's say, dt equals date time dot now and then time zone dot utc. So this is just plain Python right now. So we've got that. If I do dt ISO format, you can see that once I fix that, you can see that we get this ISO formatted string. This is Python doing that. And we'll see when we use that in a model, that's also what it's going to use. So let's go ahead and try that. So class model, base model, and we'll have dt, which is a date time, like so. Now I'm going to create an instance of that model. I'm going to say m equals model, dt equals, and I'm just going to copy this over here. And if we look at m, we have that representation. If we do a model dump, now the model dump is dumping to a dictionary. So by default, Pydantic isn't going to try and serialize this date time to a string, right? That's what ISO format is, it's a string. So if you do a plain model dump, you just get that date time object as is. But if you do the model dump JSON, then of course JSON doesn't know anything about date time objects. It has to be serialized as a string. And indeed you can see it was serialized to a string and it basically used an ISO formatted string, very similar to what we have here using Python's built-in ISO format. So sometimes we want to override this serialization. Now we have to be a bit careful since we actually have two modes of serialization, right? We are serializing to either a Python dictionary, that's the model dump. So we're, we're essentially dumping to dictionaries and Python objects, which is why with the model dump, we can actually serialize to a date time object but we can also be serializing to JSON, in which case it's gonna to have to be things like, for example, the string representation of the date time. Now let's say that we wanna customize the float serialization so that all floats are rounded to two decimal places in both the dictionary and the JSON serialization. So we're gonna start there. So from Pydantic, I'm gonna to need to import fields serializer. And let's go ahead and create a model and we'll do base model and I'm just going to create just the number float like we had before. So I'm just going to do that one. And now I'm going to create a field serializer. Field serializer is a decorator and it is going to be used to decorate a function which is going to be essentially an instance method. So let's call it serialize float. Now, of course, it's an instance method, so the first variable is going to be self, but Pydantic also injects the value of the field being serialized. What is the field being serialized here? Well, we have to specify it, and we specify it in the decorator itself. We say, well, this is for the field number. And there are ways where you can get the field serializer to apply to multiple fields in your model or all the fields in your model. I won't get into that here, but it is possible to do that. So what do we want to do here? Well, I just want to return round of value comma two. So when it's going to serialize to dictionaries, it is basically going to give me the rounded value as a float in the dictionary. But of course, when we serialize to JSON, we're returning a float here, and then Pydantic is going to take that float and serialize it to a string because it needs to serialize you know, the floats essentially to, a, to characters, right, in a JSON string. Okay. So once we have that, then we can create a model. Model, let's say we'll take the one third example that we had just now. And if we do a model dump, you'll notice that now we get 0 0.33, not all those threes that we had before. And then same thing if we dump to JSON, it is also 0 0.33. And that's because in both cases, model dump and model JSON, this function over here was called. Now for the date time, however, I do not want to modify the serialization of the date time. I only want to modify the serialization to JSON because I want to override the way in which this is essentially being represented in the JSON. I just want to customize that. But I don't want to affect what's being serialized for the dictionary. I still want the date time here. I don't want to modify that. I just want to modify the JSON piece.
In fact, I'm going to go one step further and say, I only want to modify the serialization to JSON if the number was not none, or if the date time, because we're going to be doing date time, was not none. Now, in this case, it can never be none because we don't have, you know, it's not nullable. So it can never be none. And so it doesn't really matter. But still, in general, you don't need to override the serialization when the object value is none, because the JSON serialization of none is going to be null. And the dictionary serialization of none is just going to be the same non object. So we don't need to usually worry about those. There are cases where you do want to override how things, how the non object gets serialized, but in general, you don't. So let me start with this model again. And let's add a field. Let's call it DT date time. And I want to create a field serializer to customize how DT gets serialized. But I only want it to apply if we're serializing to JSON. So we're going to start again with field serializer and we're going to be setting it for this field DT and then we can say def serialize, let's say date time to JSON. And of course it's an instance method and it's going to receive the value being serialized. And what I want to do here is I want to return my value, which should be a date time. I'm guaranteed it's going to be a date time. I'm also guaranteed it's not none in this case because of the model. So I can just basically call uh, string format time and we're going to use this pattern over here. We'll say we want the year slash, we want the uh, one character or two characters, but we don't want the leading zero basically for the month. Then we want the day, but again, without the leading zero, so percentage minus D. Then I want a space, then I want the 20, the uh, 12 hour clock, and I want the number of minutes, and I want the AM PM over here. The problem though, is that this is going to apply as we saw to both the dictionary and JSON serialization. In order to stop it and only make it apply to the JSON serialization, we have to specify an extra argument here in the decorator called when used. And it should be used when serializing to JSON. But, and that's, that's valid, you can do that. But I also want to say, I don't want to handle this if it's none. So in general, I always use JSON unless none. Even though in this case, this is never going to be none, but maybe it was a nullable field, right? Maybe it was this, in which case you'd have to now deal with the fact that value could possibly be none. And of course, this would fail. So by saying JSON unless none, even if date time is nullable and none, it's not going to run our serializer. So let's go ahead and try it. Let's say M equals. Oh, you know what? Let me go ahead and set it to be a default. So I'm going to remove that. Let's go back to the default that we had. So field default factory equals, and we'll say lambda, and it was date time dot now time zone dot UTC, like so. So now I can create the reason why, because I don't want to have to specify a date every time. So I'm just going to say model number equals one third, for example. So you can see we have our model. If we do a model dump, you'll see that we get our objects back. So we get this float back and we get this date time object back. But if we do an M dot model dump JSON, you'll see that it actually used our serializer this time and we have this format for the time. Okay, so this was how to write a custom serializer, custom field serializer. So now let's look at the next thing, which is custom validators. There are different types of validators available in Pydantic. One type are before validators that run before Pydantic has a chance to validate and coerce the data according to our field definition. The second type are after validators that happen after Pydantic has already processed the raw data, validated it and coerced it to the proper type as defined by the field definition. We'll see examples of that that will clarify. Now before validators can be very handy to provide custom passing of data that Pydantic would otherwise be unable to do. For example, if we try, if we put a date time in our model and if we try and pass a date that looks like this maybe uh, 
2024 slash one slash one 315 p.m. That is not going to work. It's going to fail validation. Pydantic Python cannot pass this into an actual date time object. If you want to accept that kind of input in your data, because it's being provided that way for some reason, then you would have to do a before validator, where you would basically handle passing this into a date time object before Pydantic takes its crack at it, because it will fail on that. So that's that's one very useful reason for having before validators. Now, I'm not going to cover before validators in this video. I'm only going to cover after validators. Otherwise, this video is going to be just way, way too long. Now, validators are not just validation functions. They are also transformation functions. For example, Pydantic's validators can modify the type of the data being deserialized to coerce it into the proper type. We've seen that multiple times. We passed it a string that was a valid integer inside the string, and the field was an int. It actually modified that string into an integer. So there was a transformation that occurred. It's not the validation is not just checking that you have the right type or the right values and then raising a val validation error if something happens. It also transforms data. So validators in Pydantic are validators and transformers, transformation functions. And many of Pydantic's predefined special types, I'm not going to look at any of them in this video, but there are many special types like email and URL and IP address and past date and all kinds of things, they do both validation and transformation. So an after validator can therefore be used to transform the data as it is being deserialized after Pydantic has had a chance to basically coerce it to the proper type, check you know, if you, if you provided any additional constraints on the field, it will basically pass that validation, you'll get the data in that precise type, and then it will call your custom validator. So let's take a look. So from Pydantic, we're going to import field validator. And again, that's a decorator approach. And we're going to create class model and base model. And I'm going to create this thing called absolute, this field should say, to be called absolute, and it's going to be an integer. And I want it to always be the absolute value of whatever gets passed in. So I don't want to get raise an exception if the absolute value that's passed in is, let's say, negative. You could do that. And to do that, you would use a field object. And then you would use this constraint saying that it has to be greater than, you know, strictly greater than zero, or if you want greater than or equal to zero, right? So if you do something like this, then if you, you can create a model and you can pass in the absolute equal to 10. That will work just fine. But if you try to do model absolute, let's say negative five, you're going to get a validation exception because it failed this constraint over here. So what I want, though, is not that. What I want is I want to essentially modify this value, right, so that if a negative integer was passed in or a negative value was passed in, I want it to become a positive value. I just want to take the absolute value every time. So to do that, I'm going to have to create a validator that's going to be a transformation validator. So we're going to do a field validator. And this is very much like the serializer. You have to just specify which field or fields, because you could actually specify multiple. But in this case, I only want it to apply to this one field called absolute. Now, field validators, unlike serializers, if you think about serializers, serializers will run after the model has been created and everything. Validators, on the other hand, are going to run before the model instance has been actually created, right? Because Pydantic is in the process of creating an instance of your model, but it's validating the data and so on. So that's why serializers are instance methods. But field validators are actually class methods. And here we're going to call it make absolute. Now, of course, it's a class method, so it takes class as its first argument, and then value. Technically, you don't have to pass, you don't have to set class method. If you do field validators with a function, Pydantic will automatically wrap it with class method. 
But if you're using linting, things like that, or IDEs, they're going to complain saying, well, you know, you're, you're using class here, but this is not a class method. You need to decorate it with class method. So you should do it in this order, though. You first do the class method decorator, and then on top of that, you stack the field validator. That's important. And so all I want to do here, and the value is, of course, the value that's being validated. It's going to be this absolute value that's passing through our validation. And I just want it to be the absolute of that value. Now, you'll notice I'm not checking to see what the type is of value, because it could be a string, in which case absolute of a string isn't exactly going to work. But this is an after validator. So this means that by the time this field validator is called, the absolute field has already been validated and coerced to an integer. So what we get here in value will definitely be an integer and it will definitely not be none since this is not a nullable field. And so we can basically, without testing or checking or guarding for anything, we can just say return the absolute value of value. So when we do this, we can now say model absolute equals, let's say, 10. That's going to work correctly. But we can also say model absolute equals negative 10. And you see what happens? Our data now is still 10. So the absolute value was returned. So one thing that's important to note, of course, because this is an after validator, is that it only gets called after Pydantic has had a chance to basically take this and turn it into an integer, and then it calls our validator. But if it fails validation, then our validator will not even get called. Let me go ahead and let me put this print function in our validator, just so we can see what's being called, that it, or that it is being called, and what type the value is. So I, that's the only change that I made. So when I call it with absolute 10, you can see that it was running the custom validator with a value of 10, and it was an integer. And then the same thing, of course, would happen with negative 10. But now, look what happens when I call it with, let's say, the integer negative 10, but as a string. So that's not an integer, that's a string. But look what happens in our validator. We still received the integer, and we received negative 10. So this is what I mean by Pydantic takes first crack at it, to do whatever it can here. So if there was field constraints like the integer, you know, has to be less than, you know, a certain value or greater than a certain value, whatever the case is. So if I say field must be greater than or equal to negative 100. So let's say I'm only going to allow that, right? So if I try and do this model absolute equals negative 200, of course, I'm going to get an exception. Right? I'm going to get the validation error. Input should be greater than 100. And moreover, you can see that that print statement that we had was not called. And that's because it failed validation at this stage of the game. So therefore, the after validator here never got called. Now, of course, I mentioned that we can use validators for transformations. But of course, validators can also be used for validating data. So let's take a look at this example where I want to define a field that should be a list of unique integers. So this is purely validation now. I'm not going to do any transformations. I just want to make sure that all the elements of a particular list are unique. So let's go ahead and create this model. So class model will inherit from base model. And we're going to say numbers and then list int equals. And I'm going to use that default. That's perfectly acceptable. And now I'm going to create a field validator. It's going to apply to the numbers field. And then, of course, it's a class method. And then we're going to just say ensure unique. I'm going to call the function ensure unique. And of course, class, and it's going to receive a value. You can name that whatever you want. It's a positional argument. Pydantic will pass it positionally. So you can call that whatever you want. I'm going to call it numbers since that's the field name. And here I'm going to test this way. I'm going to say if the length of the set of numbers. So I know that I can do that because it's a list of integers. So of course, sets can only contain hashable elements, but integers are hashable. So this will work perfectly fine. So if the length of the set is 
is not equal to the length of the numbers, that means I have some non-unique elements in that list. So in that case, I'm going to raise an exception. Now you do not raise a validation error in Pydantic. Instead, there are a few other errors you can raise, one of which is value error, and that's probably the one you should raise. The other two are assertion errors, but don't use those because Py Python can be run without executing assertions by just setting essentially a command line parameter. So you cannot rely on assertions to you know, generate your, your, your exceptions. Um, so raise a value error. There is also another custom error that's available in Pydantic for validation errors that is a bit more flexible, but really here value error works most of the time. And here we're going to specify an error message. So elements must be unique. So you raise a value error. You do not raise things like type errors and key errors and those kinds of things because those will bubble up as regular errors. When you raise a value error, Pydantic is going to transform that error and raise it as a validation error. The same validation error we've been seeing it will take that value error and instead raise the validation error, which is what people expect when they get a validation error of Pydantic. The expectation is it should be a validation error, not a type error or a key error, right? So you, you want to be consistent. So to do that, just raise a value error. And of course, if nothing was wrong, then we're just going to return the numbers as is. Remember that your validators have to return whatever the validated value is. In this case, I'm not doing any transformation on numbers. I'm just doing this check. So we can go ahead and create numbers equals one, two, three, like so. That's going to work just fine. And of course, I made this lowercase. So let me change that to uppercase. Let me change that to uppercase. Let's be consistent in our naming conventions. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try. I'm going to try model and I'm going to pass it a list of numbers that are not unique. And you could even, you know, since remember, this is an after validator. So even if I pass in elements that are not integers, it will coerce them to integers if it can. So I can pass it one, one, two, and three, like so, for example. That is still going to pass validation, Pydantic's validation. But of course, it should fail our custom validator because we have this repeated element. So accept validation error as ex, and then just print the exception. And as you can see, we get the validation error. The elements must be unique. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is nested models. And essentially, you can nest Pydantic models. And the deserialization and serialization of the submodels will be handled by Pydantic automatically. So let's say that I have this model here, or this data, I should say. It's not a model yet. This is data that I'm getting from somewhere. And I want to deserialize that into a Pydantic model. Now you'll notice that we have first name is a string, last name is a string, but born is a dictionary. And inside there we have place, which is itself a dictionary, and then date, which is a date. So as you can see, we have these nested dictionaries. And so the way we're going to model this is by using essentially nested Pydantic models. And to do that, we use composition. So let's go ahead and actually do this. It's way simpler than it sounds. And let's go ahead and create the model. So the way I do it is I work from the inside out. So I start at this kind of most nested level, which is place. So we're going to create a model for that. So I'm just going to call it place for lack of a better name for it. And what does place have? Place has country, which is a string, and it has city, which is also going to be a string. Great. Now I have this born thing. Born has two fields in it, place and date. So I'm going to call it born base model. It's going to have this place field. Now, what is the type for place field? Well, it's exactly this place model here. So we're going to specify that as the type hint. This is model composition. We're essentially using composition to define these nested Pydantic models. And then we have date and date is going to be just a date. So I'm going to need that date that I imported already. So we're fine. Now, I don't want to call it date because that's kind of weird looking. I mean, it technically should work, but of course we don't do that. And what I'm going to do here is just call it DT. 
So this means though that I have to specify an alias. So we'll say field alias equals date because that's what it's specified as in our dictionary that we're going to deserialize. Okay, and then lastly, working our way further out, now we have this person object over here and it has three fields, first name, last name, and born. So now let's go ahead and model that. So class person base model, it has first name and I want to use Python conventions. So it's going to be first name, that's going to be a string. I'm going to make it nullable so I don't care if the first name is null or not. And of course I have to specify an alias. So we'll specify the alias to be first name. And then also I'm going to specify a default so it won't be required. So it's nullable and optional. And when it is defaulted, I will make it none, which is why of course I had to make it nullable. Keep that in mind. Then last name is gonna be a string and I'm not gonna make it nullable or, op or uh, optional but I do have to define the alias. So that's gonna be the alias here. And then finally, I have born. So born is what? Well, it's an instance of this born model. And I'm not gonna make it optional, and I'm not gonna make it nullable. If I wanted to make it nullable, I would just say born or none. And if I wanted to make it optional, I would just have to specify a default. In this case, since it's nullable, I'm gonna set the default to none. So you could do that as well if you want to. And now we can go ahead and deserialize our data. So let's try that and let's see if I coded everything correctly. So we'll do model validate and then we'll pass it data. And I just have to type that right. And no validation exceptions, that's great. And then if we look at what the representation is, you can see we have first name, last name, born is an instance of the born, place is an instance of the place model, country, city, and then we have our date time. And you can access the data, of course, using dot notation. They're nested, so we can look at author.born. Where were they born? And maybe I want the place. So now I need to look at the place under born, and I want to see the uh, country, for example. You can see we get lunar colony. Of course, you can also assign, right? These are not frozen mut uh, immutable fields you can assign values to them as well using the same thing. And when you do the model dump, of course, you will get those nested dictionaries back as well. You can see we have a nested dictionary and a nested dictionary. And then the same thing will happen if we model dump to JSON. And of course, if we model dump to JSON, so author model dump JSON, it doesn't look very easy to read, neither did the dictionary for that matter. So a couple of things you can do to get a better um, a, b a better idea of what dictionary looks like when you're printing it, you can say from pprint import pprint, and then you can just pprint this model dump. It will try and format it in a slightly better format. You can see it's a little bit better. In my mind, actually, the JSON one is the best, but of course, not this way. So what you can do is you can actually say author.model.dump.json and then pass in indent, for example, equals two. And then when you print, you have to print it. So if you just do the representation, I'll show you that, then you can see that the indent equals two now has resulted in things like new lines and spacing and all that kind of stuff. But it's very difficult to actually see what's going on here. Instead, what we want to do is to actually just print it. And when we print it, now we get this nice looking output over here. All right, so this was a very quick overview of creating models in Pydantic with some extra functionality such as custom serializers and custom validators. But we've really just scratched the surface. There is a whole lot more to Pydantic than just this. And depending on your needs, this might be sufficient, what I've covered here, but more likely, you're going to have to dig deeper into the library. For example, instead of defining these single-use custom serializers and validators that we saw directly in our models, we can create custom types using type annotations that attach those validators and serializers to the type itself, and then that type can be reused across fields, different fields in different models, and so on. So you get a lot of reusability, and Pydantic makes heavy use of annotated types. Now, I also mentioned that we have before and after validators. 
And in fact, validation is a pipeline where you can specify multiple before and after validators, either directly in the model using the decorators we saw or to types using the annotations that I just mentioned, and Pydantic will execute the validators one after the other to arrive at the final result. So you can actually set up these validation pipelines. And then Pydantic also supports lots of other features like how to handle extra fields, fields that are in the data but not in the model, how to make fields or the entire model immutable, how to auto-generate aliases. Very often in our models, we're going from camel case to snake case because we're dealing with Python variables and we're dealing with JSON variables or JSON data, JSON keys. So we have to go between camel case and snake case. And you can use the alias, you can you know modify that yourself, you can specify it yourself, but there's also a way to automatically generate, let's say, the aliases, the camel case aliases from the snake case field names. Very handy to have. You also have other things with aliases. You can have serialization aliases and validation aliases. You can do dependent field validation. So if you have, let's say, a model where you have a start date and end date in the model, you may want to add a validation that makes sure that the end date doesn't come before the start date. You can do that again with Pydantic. It can handle enumerations. It can handle model inheritance where you can have customized base models with these configurations. I showed you one, which is the populate by name, but there's lots of other configurations that you can do at the model level, like extra fields, auto-generated aliases, and so on. Instead of having to retype that information on all your models, you create a custom base model with that configuration, then you inherit it in your other models. So it works that way as well. There's a lot of specialized types that Pydantic provides, things like emails and URLs and UUIDs and many more. And there's a lot more features, far more than I can possibly cover in a video like this. But if you do want to go deeper, and I know this is a shameless plug, but if you do want to go deeper and explore these different topics and really leverage Pydantic, you can check out my Udemy course where I basically deep dive into Pydantic. I'll even, I even show in that course how you can leverage Pydantic to validate just plain function calls to Python functions, to your own custom functions. And so instead of writing validation code inside your functions, you can actually use Pydantic to define these things with these annotated types and the field validators and so on and to, to validate the data that's being passed when, it, when one of your functions is being called. So that's very, very handy to have as well. And I cover that in that course as well as a ton of other things as well. All right, so thanks for watching and hopefully you enjoyed Pydantic V2. It's a great library and it's extremely useful for a variety of topics, not just for REST APIs. You can use it to validate data coming in and out of queues. You can use it to uh, validate and serialize or deserialize data in let's say Redis, let's say you're storing your data, you know, your values as a JSON object. Well, you're gonna to need to deserialize and serialize that data and possibly validate it as well. Or maybe you're storing it in a Dynamo table and one of your fields happens to be JSON and all kinds of things. So there's tons of applications of Pydantic other than just fast API. All right, thanks for watching.